Welcome to Enviro Close Up. I'm Carl Grossman in our studio in New York, speaking to Richard Heinberg. He's out at the 15th annual Bioneers Conference in San Rafael, California. Richard is a professor at New College, not far away in California, and he's the author of a number of books, including The Parties Over Oil, War, and the Fate of Industrial Societies. How are you, Richard? Very well, thanks, Carl. Good to be with you. Richard, your, your central message is we're running out of oil and fast and heading for big trouble. That's right. Uh, right now, as we're speaking, oil's at about $55 a barrel. And uh, of course, that's a record price. But I think it, we're likely to see much higher prices in the very near future. And the reason for that has to do with geology. Uh, nature only puts so much oil in the ground to start with. And we have extracted so far about half of what we're ultimately going to be able to extract. And the significance of that is that there's a natural kind of bell-shaped curve of oil extraction for any given uh, province or country. When you get to about ha the halfway point, uh, it becomes impossible to maintain the same rate of extraction. So the rate of extraction will decrease. Again, well, what's, what's the big deal about that? Well, it's that uh, we have built an entire civilization that is based upon cheap energy and the necessity of more and more oil every year in order to run our cars, in order to use for agriculture, to run farm machinery, and also to transport food. We also use oil as a feedstock for petrochemicals, including agricultural chemicals. So our entire way of life really is based both on cheap energy and especially on a particular kind of cheap energy, which is fossil fuel, oil, and natural gas. So if we get to the point, as we will in the very near future, when there is actually less oil available every year to go around, no matter what we do, no matter how many oil wells we drill, or how much we invest on exploration, that will mean the end of the growth phase of industrial civilization. And nobody's ready for that. We have literally no plan B in place. No government in the world is prepared for the implications of peak oil. Every year, there are fewer nations in the column of oil producing nations and oil exporting nations, and more countries in the column of oil importing nations. For example, China was self-sufficient in oil for many decades, until the early 1990s, in fact. It has the huge Da Qing oil field, one of the largest in the world. But just in the last few years, Da Qing production has peaked, and China's oil imports have skyrocketed at a rate now of about 40% a year. Also, China's demand for oil is increasing dramatically. We all have nice pictures in our minds of millions of Chinese riding their bicycles through city streets. But in fact, just in the last year, Shanghai has banned bicycles on city streets because they're getting in the way of cars. So many Chinese now want to own cars that this is driving the demand for oil in China through the roof. This is one of the factors that's leading to such high oil prices globally. But it's also one of the factors that's leading to the imminent peak in global oil production. In the parties over and in your companion book, Power Down, Options and Actions for a Post-Carbon World, you carefully describe the, the options to replace oil. Yes. Well, I, uh, as you can imagine, I'm a very passionate advocate of renewable energy alternatives like solar and wind, uh, biofuels, and so on. At the same time, uh, I think it's important for us to understand that there is not going to be a quick and easy and cheap fix to the problem of oil depletion. There might have been, if we had started in the 1970s with renewables and conservation, and really applied those strenuously and maintained the effort until the present. But that's not what happened. We started in the 1970s and then we dropped the ball. As a result, we are still overwhelmingly dependent on fossil fuels. Right now, solar power and wind power together combined make up 
far less than 1% of our national energy budget. In fact, it's something like 0.17%, which means that if we were to double our current wind and solar capacity and then double that again, that's no mean feat, we'd still be at less than 1%. So we're talking about the need for literally hundreds of billions, perhaps trillions of dollars of investment in new energy infrastructure to make up for fossil fuels as these become increasingly rare, scarce, and expensive. Interesting. You're kind of skeptical about hydrogen. Why? Well, hydrogen, of course, is not a real energy source. It's just a way of storing energy, uh, just as batteries are. And in fact, uh, most research so far has shown that batteries are actually a more efficient means of energy storage for most smaller applications like powering a car or a home than is hydrogen. Now I believe that hydrogen will in fact have important niche applications. For example, if you have a wind farm, not just one uh, wind rotor but a, but a whole array of them, it would be very impractical to store the energy uh, at night uh, when you're generating more wind power uh, wind generated electricity than you actually can use at the moment. It would be impractical to store that with, uh, with batteries. And that may be a good use for, for hydrogen. And then that hydrogen could be used to power essential vehicles like um, ambulances or uh, trucks that are, that are carrying food and so on. Where I live in, in Sonoma County, California is, is wine country and so everybody there is pretty familiar with how wine is made. You start with a vat of grape juice and you, and you add some uh, yeast, particular kinds of yeast. And the yeast, of course, immediately proliferate. Uh, this is a boundless food source for them and so their, their numbers uh, increase exponentially. But meanwhile, they're eating up the food source and also they begin to poison themselves with their own excrement, which of course is alcohol, which is the point of the whole exercise as far as we're concerned. Now, the, the question that I ask my students is, are we smarter than yeast? Because we're effectively doing the same thing. We found this seemingly endless source of cheap energy, which is uh, analogous to the the seemingly endless source of food for the, for the, uh, uh, the yeast organisms in the, in the vat of grape juice. And we have proliferated wildly and now we are poisoning ourselves with our own effluent in the form of uh, CO2 emissions into the atmosphere, global warming, and all sorts of other pollution. So are we going to be able to use the intelligence that we believe that we have as human beings? I certainly hope so. That, that intelligence expresses itself as an ability to understand the consequences of our actions and to change our actions accordingly. That's what we need to do right now. Sounds very simple, but uh, a lot is riding on the outcome. Thank you, Richard Heinberg, for being with us on Enviro Close Up and for your, your most timely work. And thank you for watching. If you'd like a copy of this or any Enviro Close-Up Program, visit our website at www.envirovideo.com. I'm Carl Grossman.